A reading from the first letter of St. John. Beloved, we love God because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, but hates his brother, he is a liar. For whoever does not love a brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. This is the commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is begotten by God. And everyone who loves the Father loves also the one begotten by him. In this way, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For whoever is begotten by God conquers the world. And the victory that conquers the world is our faith. The word of the Lord. Lord, every nation on earth will adore you. O God, with your judgment endow the king, and with your justice the king's son. He shall govern your people with justice, and your afflicted ones with judgment. From fraud and violence he shall redeem them, and precious shall their blood be in his sight. May they be prayed for continually, day by day shall they bless him. May his name be blessed forever, as long as the Son, his name, shall remain. In him shall all the tribes of the earth be blessed, all the nations shall proclaim his happiness. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Luca. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news of him spread throughout the whole region. He taught in their synagogues and was praised by all. He came to Nazareth, where he had grown up, and went according to his custom into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stood up to read and was handed a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the passage where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim a year acceptable to the Lord. Rolling up the scroll, he handed it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue looked intently at him. He said to them, Today this scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke highly of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. 
Erbom du Armini. Today's Gospel tells us very beautifully that every possible human misery, such things as poverty and captivity, blindness, illness and disease, oppression of any kind, is met and answered by the One, capital O, is met and answered by the One who reads the Word of God in the synagogue in today's gospel, Jesus Christ. The God-man tells us, he has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim a year acceptable to the Lord, making reference to his heavenly Father who sent him. And that last phrase, and to proclaim a year acceptable to the Lord, is one of the scriptural passages both from the Old and New Testament, that Holy Mother Church uses in her defense of proclaiming a holy year every 25 years, or a special holy year sometime during that interval, maybe not quite 25 years, like we had the Jubilee Year of Mercy, for example. Uh, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI called for a year for priests. He called for a year of faith during his six years of pontificate and to proclaim a year acceptable to the Lord. In our personal lives, let us strive then to make this new year, 2019, a year acceptable to the Lord in our own life, in our own way of living. Let's turn to him in ways that maybe we never have before, or maybe we have, but not with the enthusiasm that we should have. Now, how can we do this? How can we make 2019 a great year acceptable to the Lord in a way that I never have focused on in the past, at least not to the degree that I should have, all the while striving to be that best version of self, all the while striving to be that great Catholic Christian that I'm called to be? Well, I've got one category to propose to you. And it's the category of the sacraments, the seven sacraments. In other words, a great way to make 2019 a little different for the better, a great way to make 2019 a year acceptable to the Lord in a way that maybe we hadn't focused on in the past, at least not to the degree we should have, is to live a greater active sacramental life, a greater active sacramental economy in my life, what the catechism would call living the sacramental economy. All that's afforded for the individual from the seven sacraments. And I've preached before in the past how every sacrament affects you, even though you may not have received that sacrament. For example, you marrieds may not have the sacrament of holy orders. Priests may not have the sacrament of matrimony. I say may not have in both cases because we do have cases where we have married priests. For example, Anglican pastors married who have come over into the church and who have been ordained to the Catholic priesthood. But for the most part, the marrieds don't have holy orders and those in holy orders don't have matrimony. Okay? But yet it still affects the person. Marriage is important for priests. Priests need to be able to know and defend marriage. The priesthood is important for married couples. Married couples need to know and defend that sacrament of holy orders. So in our personal lives, let us strive to make 2019 a year acceptable to the Lord with a greater active sacramental economy. So for example, baptism. Why not print off the internet from a great Catholic website like EWTN.com <laughs> or catholic.com, Catholic Answers out of San Diego, print out the baptismal promises from the baptismal ritual and commit yourself 
say on the first Friday in honor of the Sacred Heart of each month or the first Saturday in honor of the Immaculate Heart of Mary each month to renew your baptismal promises. And how about adding the days of your birthday and adding the day also of the day you were baptized? You can find out exactly what day you were baptized, even if you don't have a copy of the baptismal certificate. You can call the parish where you were baptized and they will have it on the roster. And make that a celebratory day along with your birthday, celebrating the great gift of life, the great gift of baptized life, huh? And pray frequently those baptismal vows. Matrimony? How about a weekend retreat this year sometime for you and your spouse? Call your diocesan or archdiocesan family life office and ask about what retreats are being offered and what themes are those retreats. And if maybe none of those appeal to you or they're being held in time frames that don't uh, fit into your own schedule, call a neighboring diocese or a neighboring archdiocese. Together with the retreat, as a married couple, make a pilgrimage to a holy site. Something that's more uh, vacation-y slash pilgrimage. Not so much a retreat, I want you to do that too, but something more uh, fun, something more vacation-y, something more along the lines of a pilgrimage. Do those two things. Maybe in one six-month block of 2019, do the retreat or the pilgrimage. And in the other six-month block of 2019, do the opposite one. Holy orders, for those of us in holy orders, the same thing. Take a clerical retreat. Find out where retreats are being held, either in your own diocese or in a neighboring diocese, maybe at a, at a retreat house ran by a religious order. Make sure it's a solid orthodox retreat. Same thing for the married couples. There's a lot of craziness out there. That's no secret. Okay. And then in addition to the retreat for priests, for clerics, this includes bishops, how about taking a pilgrimage somewhere, going to a holy site? Again, split up the year, six months and six months. Confession, faithfully once a month, 12 times this year during 2019. 12 is not too much to ask when the year has 365 days in it. Twelve is a drop in the bucket, as they say, compared to over 360 times, 360 days. Good, holy, reverent confession. And that's whether we're single, married, or consecrated religious. The Eucharist, receive the Eucharist worthily, at least weekly, coupled with your Sunday obligation mass. Go more frequently if you can during the week, like those of you here this morning on this Thursday morning, but not everybody can do that. But Sundays are obligatory. We forget that every Sunday is a holy day of obligation, not because we fear God with servile fear, but because we love God with filial fear. We talked about that yesterday. So monthly confession, weekly Eucharist. Confirmation. Maybe you're not confirmed. You know, I read this about a year and a half ago, and I wish I would have taken down the source, and I didn't, and I have not been able to find it since. But I read in a Catholic article about a year, year and a half ago, that the Catholic Church right now has the highest number of Catholics, adults, non-confirmed. Why? Because after the closing of the Second Vatican Council, not to blame the Council, the Council was solid as a rock, but after the Second Vatican Council, when more progressive forces took hold of things and ran with the Vatican II ball in the wrong direction, as I like to say, parents, for one reason or another, did not continue their child's CCD or catechism coursework, especially the public school students. The parents did not enforce them to continue on after the eighth grade. Well, in the United States, for the most part, it's 8th grade to 10th grade that we receive the Sacrament of Confirmation. There can be exceptions, but that's normally when it's received, between the 8th and 10th grade. Some dioceses do it younger, some do it at that time. The point is, as the decades have gone on from the late 60s onwards, this was not enforced. And so we have a high number of adults now, Catholics, who are not confirmed. 
So if you're a Catholic Christian listening to this homily and you're not confirmed, get confirmed. The article said that we are now entering the fourth generation of adults. They would be just now entering young adulthood. This is from the close of the Second Vatican Council, 1965. Again, not to blame the council. The council itself has nothing to do with this sad statistic, if it's true. But from 65 onwards now, just having passed 2015 a few years ago, okay, now into 2019, almost another set of five years after that, will be in 2020 next year, we're entering our fourth generation of non-confirmed, a high percentage of non-confirmed Catholic Christians. So get confirmed. Let your parish priest know that you have first confession, you have first Holy Communion, you've received those sacraments, you're just not confirmed. And you can get enrolled into an RCIA program as a, as a confirmand, a confirmandi, who at the Easter Vigil needs to receive only that sacrament. Also, I know of pastors that when it's just the case of only confirmation being needed, it's not a full catechumen that needs baptism, first communion, and uh, confirmation at the Easter Vigil. When they only need confirmation, quite often the pastor assigns their dir director of religious ed, their DRE, to work with that one person one-on-one. -on -one. And re they receive confirmation, not at the Easter Vigil, but they receive it privately in a private ceremony with family. And it's very intimate and it's very beautiful. So it can be done on its own. That being said, many parishes as well have those that need just confirmation come in during the Easter Vigil. Okay, either way is fine. Depends on, on the schedule of the parish. Okay? The fact is, get confirmed. We're about to talk more about confirmation here in a moment because today's gospel especially uh, revolves around the beautiful sacrament of confirmation. Then there's the anointing of the sick. How many times do I hear in my parish mission travels, somebody at the parish where I happen to be preaching a week-long mission, they tell me that their relative died of, of this ailment or this accident or, or whatever, and they did not receive uh, the sacrament of the anointing of the sick prior to their death. They maybe did not die immediately in the accident, but they were in ICU for a while, and nobody in the family called for the last rites of the church, which includes the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, along with prayers of commendation of the dying, along with holy viaticum, one's final holy communion, if they're able to receive it, they may not be able to receive viaticum if there's a lot of apparatus uh, connected to them because of the post-accident trauma situation in the ICU. And then the apostolic pardon. What a grace to receive the apostolic pardon at the time of your death. And there's relatives of those who are dying or those who are near death who don't even think to call the priest to the bedside of the loved one to receive the anointing of the sick, let alone the other three rites that collectively with the anointing of the sick, all four make up what we call the last rites because it's literally at the threshold of one's death. You can receive the anointing of the sick when you are not necessarily at death's threshold. Vatican II teaches very beautifully, as does canon law, the 1983 code. One can receive the anointing of the sick whenever one begins to be in danger of death because of sickness or old age. Whenever one begins to be in danger of death because of sickness or old age. So you can find out that you have cancer, but the doctors have told you you have a, you know, another year, prognosis, another two years. Start receiving the anointing of the sick faithfully each month. There's people that don't do that. Let alone the ones who are at death's threshold and the family members don't even think to call the priest. This is what I mean by we need to live a greater active sacramental economy, huh? A greater active sacramental living. Baptism, matrimony, holy orders, regular confession, regular Eucharist, confirmation, and the anointing of the sick. By the way, with confirmation, for those of us who are confirmed, again, go to a good solid Catholic website, print out the ritual of confirmation. The words that the bishop or the properly deputed priest said to you that day that you were confirmed, even if it happened years ago when you were in the eighth grade, go make a holy hour before the blessed sacrament exposed and for your spiritual reading that hour, just read the ritual of confirmation. 
and rekindle in your mind and heart those words that were imparted to you that day by your local bishop, the day you were confirmed with your confirmation class. What a beautiful practice that would be to rekindle in mind and heart. I do that now and again with the ordination ritual from the day I was ordained back in 2000, June 10th of the great Jubilee year 2000. It's nice to rekindle in mind and heart those words that the bishop was imparting over me before and after the laying on of hands at ordination. So we got to rekindle in our mind and heart this beautiful sacramental living, this beautiful sacramental economy. As we listen to God's voice, the truth that conquers all our burdens becomes clear. God has first loved us. Words from the first letter of John that we heard today and that we've been hearing all week. Even Jim Deering, our faithful sacristan, made a comment earlier on in the week to me before Mass began back in the sacristy. He says, the church really wants to emphasize the love of God through this first letter of St. John, doesn't it, Father Wade? I said, absolutely. God has first loved us. And because God doesn't have to wait for us to love him first, no weakness or failure should prevent us from turning to him. Jesus makes it possible for us to say with God, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Which brings us back to the sacrament of confirmation, the calling down of the Holy Spirit. Confirmation is the sacrament by which Catholics receive a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Through confirmation, the Holy Spirit gives them the increased ability to practice their Catholic faith in every aspect of their lives and to witness Christ in every situation, even the negative ones. In short, the sacrament of confirmation deepens our union with Christ and helps us to proclaim our faith in him before others. The effects of the sacrament of confirmation are as follows. An increased portion of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, wisdom, knowledge, right judgment or counsel, understanding, courage, piety, and fear of the Lord. A deepening and strengthening of the grace received at baptism. Confirmation strengthens and increases the grace we received at baptism, which is considered the presence of God in the soul, which makes it possible to live the divine life in participation in God's own divine life. Number three, a more intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, a closer bond with the Catholic Church, the ability to take on a greater, more mature role in the church's mission of living the Christian faith daily and witnessing to Christ everywhere. And number six, a special mark or character on the soul that can never be erased. It's like baptism and holy orders, huh? Baptism, confirmation, and holy orders. Those three sacraments impart an indelible mark, a spiritual character never to be erased. That's why it's called an indelible mark. Also, confirmation roots us more deeply in the divine filiation, that is, of being adopted as sons and daughters of God the Father, which makes us cry out with great love, Abba, Father. Confirmation unites us more firmly to Jesus Christ. Confirmation also increases the seven, not only increases the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, but also the twelve fruits of the Holy Spirit. Joy, charity, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, generosity, gentleness, faithfulness, modesty, self-control, and chastity. Confirmation renders our bond with the church more perfect, not only strengthens it, but makes it more perfect. Be ye perfect as my heavenly Father is perfect. And confirmation gives us a special strength of the Holy Spirit, as I said earlier, to spread and defend the faith by word and action as true witnesses of Christ, to confess the name of our Lord Jesus Christ boldly, and never to be ashamed of the cross. And how many Catholic Christian adults now the fourth generation just entering their young adulthood, late teens, early 20s, the fourth generation since the closing of the council, again, not to blame the council, who are not even confirmed. 
Maybe this is why some pockets of the church are weak. And it's up to us to strengthen them. Live an active sacramental economy during 2019. Make this a year acceptable to the Lord. Amen? Amen. God bless you.